Mine is going to be about treat, treating metastatic uh, hormone sensitive or endocrine naive uh, patients with um, metastatic prostate cancer. These are um, my relevant disclosures. Uh, most of them have been, you know, more of an ad board type role um, for these companies that uh, make advanced prostate cancer products. Um, the gaps here, one, uh, patients with um, metastatic disease have undergone kind of a, an evolution in their treatments, and this doesn't appear to be the uh, one that correlates with my talk, so I'll, I'll just say this one does. Um, talk about patients with newly diagnosed metastatic uh, prostate cancer, uh, both uh, terms of dividing them up into how they present in low risk or high risk uh, states, because that um, often impacts how they behaved in the clinical trials. Uh, talk about the added role of additional androgen um, ablation in patients on traditional hormonal therapy, and also to talk about the uh, role of uh, adding chemotherapy in the referral. So we know that, you know, the stage of the presentation has a lot to do with prediction of outcomes. These are just some historical things, but obviously we're not curing patients with advanced or metastatic prostate cancer with any of these treatments, but we are controlling their disease and slowing their disease, and we've made some major moves forward. It used to be that, on average, you got about 18 months of cancer control if you presented with bone metastases. Now we um, can take them years, uh, beyond five years in some cases. So there have been improvements, but we're still not curing them. These numbers are hard to get, like, okay, what, are, what number of M0 patients are out there running around? What percentage of um, newly diagnosed, we're pretty good at getting those. This is a little bit old, but again, I picked it because it suggested that it was like 10,000 uh, new cases of metastatic prostate cancer. It's probably increased a little bit with some of the um, uh, step backwards in screening for prostate cancer. I know um, at Stevenson Cancer Center, we see a lot more men with advanced and metastatic disease than, than I was used to seeing in Nashville. So I think that's not just Oklahoma. I think that's really a, a statement of uh, lack of, of prostate cancer screening, uh, and it kind of catches up to us. Uh, there's a whole lot of patients, even 40 to 50,000, with now um, castration resistance in the United States, and so that's the reason to focus on these type of things. My talk's going to focus on metastatic disease as they present. Uh, it's always good to remind ourselves that we have, I think, two Nobel Prizes in, in urology, and this was one of them, uh, for the understanding that there is androgen uh, responsiveness and dependence for growth of prostate cancer, um, and that depriving uh, prostate cancer cells of androgens results in a um, remission of the disease in most cases. Uh, about 90%, probably uh, maybe 95% of initial prostate cancer that's metastatic responds to initial hormonal manipulation. Those that don't, you should pay attention. They usually have a variant like a neuroendocrine histology, and they need um, chemotherapy, and they need a referral um, uh, pretty quick if they haven't seen an oncologist. The uh, reports of um, understanding that the extent of disease uh, impacts the outcome sometimes as much as the treatment has been known now for more than 20 years. These are two of the early studies that we're looking at um, use of uh, uh, orchiectomy plus or minus flutamide, for example, and, and what they found was that really the most important thing was how advanced their disease was when they presented uh, as to how they responded. It wasn't whether they got a shot plus a pill or not. Charted, which is a study that we'll talk about in a minute, was the study that kind of gave a new modern day definition to one surrogate for outcomes, and that was extent of disease. And so if they had more than um, five, four or more bone lesions and one was outside of the um, axial skeleton or soft tissue disease, they were considered high volume. Um, so that's one that we'll talk about. And then now that that had a a bearing on the outcomes for the treatment, a lot of subsequent studies are kind of categorizing patients and subsetting the analysis of the outcomes. We know that their response to um, 
the uh, treatment is um, often a predictor of how they're going to do at about the six month mark. And so this was just some data from, from a Southwest Oncology trial looking at those patients who didn't go to less than four, but most of the patients should really go to somewhere one or less if they're truly getting a good response. But at around that six month mark, you start to see separation of how they'll ultimately do, and PSA is a surrogate for that um, in some instances. This is just a, a menu of what's out there for treatment. Most of us are very familiar with the first four. That's kind of in the urology wheelhouse. There's bone targeted therapies that we're using now, and I know that'll come up um, in later discussion today. There's the use of chemotherapy, which we've talked about in previous years in this meeting, but I think it's now kind of becoming a standard of care for all of us to consider in these patients, as well as new um, AR signaling uh, uh, medications, and we'll talk about those. A lot of us use intermittent therapy. It was mentioned earlier in the morning. Um, this was a study that tried to determine whether intermittent or continuous hormonal therapy was better. Um, it's a confusing study because their outcomes were these non-inferiority things. But the bottom line, I think, is that there is probably an overall benefit in terms of patients who present with metastatic disease for continuous over intermittent but side effects and things kind of drive other decisions, and certainly it's not a lot better. So that's why many patients do opt for intermittent therapy. Uh, the two general strategies that we have as we sit here today for metastatic disease are chemo combined with hormones or more potent androgen targeting. This was the uh, charted study that um, kind of got us for the first time in a, the, the only thing we had before this was in castration resistance, we had three months of survival advantage for men with docetaxel. Um, this study took ADT plus docetaxel versus ADT alone and randomized men with newly diagnosed. They did kind of divide them up into higher low volume, as I mentioned before. And what they found was that overall the study was positive and had more than a year of additional survival outcome. But for those men who had high volume disease, by those definitions that I previously described, there was about an 18 month overall survival advantage uh, as compared to just conventional ADT. The lower volume patients really, we didn't see that benefit. Um, this was a kind of follow up longer term um, analysis, 53 month median, and again, that same result was durable. It kind of bore out. And the results for the high risk, high volume patients were there. And for the low volume, not really. So um, that's kind of been one of the drivers for a lot of oncologists that when they see patients, it'd be nicer to have more predictive tools than just volume of disease. But it is one of the things in the equation. The charted study came out about the same time as the Stampede study, which was just another similarly designed study looking at the use of docetaxel. And again, a positive study with more than a year of overall uh, survival benefit by adding chemotherapy. Not all studies, so for example, there was a French study that didn't show benefit, but it, but it actually did show months of benefit. It just wasn't statistically significant in their trial, and there's some maybe differences in the patient selection and how, what kind of volume of cancers they had, et cetera. But when you put them all together, you've got two level one studies that show benefit. You've got meta-analysis that favor the use of docetaxel chemotherapy. And so all of us should consider it a standard of care uh, for patients with newly diagnosed metastatic disease. Besides chemotherapy, what else do we have? And so another option is the use of abiraterone with steroid. Uh, these were two back-to-back -back publications in the New England Journal that looked at adding the Zytiga or abiraterone plus prednisone to traditional hormonal therapy. And they both showed similar results. And the most important, there's you know, progression-free on on your left and, and overall survival advantage is really the, the best um, thing we could say. And so that was evidenced in this study called Latitude. And it was similarly uh, in a stampede study, similarly trial design and similar results with overall survival advantage and relative risk reduction in death from prostate cancer by adding um, another 
uh, angiosynthesis inhibitor, if you will. So the caveat on this one is it requires a steroid. It's usually only five milligrams a day, um, and you have to monitor them because there's laboratory testing like liver functions and potassium, as well as keeping an eye on their blood pressure. Um, but those are things that need to be done, and there's a kind of a formulaic way if you want to do it um, but when you start them, and then it relaxes as they um, get further out in their follow-up. So what's new? So these studies are new this year. So apalutamide, um, which you just heard about in the M0 patients, patients with PSA rises after hormonal therapy, well, now there's a study looking at it in newly diagnosed metastatic disease. So the use of apalutamide plus LHRH compared to LHRH alone showed, again, another significant improvement both uh, in progression-free survival as well as um, overall survival. Um, this uh, study was called the TITAN study, and again, it was a significant benefit. It worked in both low and high-volume patients. So it probably is not surprising to the oncologist, but they do get a lot of patients who really buy in on the, on the use of chemo. Sometimes when we present those options to them, though, our patients don't really want chemotherapy, even though we try to convince them that it would be appropriate. Um, sometimes you need options besides this. The Zytiga or the Abiraterone had a little bit of a, a barrier to um, uptake because of the use of steroids and some of the complications of steroids that our urologists weren't really very comfortable with. But uh, here, you, uh, this offers you an option that doesn't require steroids and does give them a survival benefit. I'll just go quickly because there were two studies with enzalutamide. So I showed you apalutamide. There were two studies that came out this year with um, enzalutamide as well. This one was called ARCHES. Um, again, the, it's a randomized study, hormones, hormones plus enzalutamide, and they looked at survival. This one actually looked at uh, radiographic progression free. So that's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It did meet its primary endpoint that the patients had less radiographic progression, less PSA progression, that sort of thing. Um, and that was a move forward. It worked in both low and high volume, and it also worked in patients who'd previously seen docetaxel. But the higher level study was one um, kind of powered for overall survival, and this was um, a, an enzalutamide trial looking at it in addition to LHRH. And the Enzymet study had over 1,000 men. Again, uh, it did show radiographic uh, progression free, but most importantly, there was survival advantage by using enzalutamide with newly diagnosed metastatic patients. Um, it worked in both, but it's better. It was better in lower volume patients based on the publication in the New England Journal. I'm really going to accelerate us through this oligometastatic because there is um, not a standard of care really as we sit here, uh, 2019. But we know that some men who present with metastatic disease uh, are young, healthy, and motivated. And if there were treatments that you could direct at their primary tumor, in theory, they might live longer or do better. So it is theory. Uh, some of the kind of rationale are listed here, but it's a work in progress. Um, they know from looking at some of the genetic testing that they've done on primaries and metastatic sites and then that you know the, the primary tumor spawns new metastatic sites and even the new metastatic sites spawn additional metastatic sites. So they know that some, if we don't treat the primary, we may still be at risk for continuation of this. Uh, there have been retrospective studies that said, oh, look, the people who had their primaries treated did better. But, of course, that's fraught with uh, selection bias and publication bias. You can imagine you picked the best candidates for that and then compared them to the worst candidates who didn't get primary treatment. There were two studies um, last year in radiation oncology literature that attempted to look at this, so HORAD was one of them. I'll go through this pretty quick, but basically patients with metastatic disease either had their primary treated or not, and they all had systemic therapy, and what they found was that there was no overall survival benefit in this group of patients who had radiation to their primaries compared to those who didn't. There were some 
um, kind of trends in the lower volume metastatic patients, uh, again, not statistically significant, and there were some delays in like their PSA progression. So at least that got the conversation going, and then Stampede, which is this multi-armed, multi, -armed, multi it looks like a horse race, they just add a, 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 a treatment to the comparator, which is standard of care, don't treat the primary. So Stampede at a similar trial design, treating the primary with radiation therapy, and they randomized them. And again, um, they, they separated patients into low and high volume, just like the charted study. They overall did not see a survival benefit to treating the primary with local radiation, but they did um, start to see some PSA uh, failure-free survival, if you will. And then when they subsetted these patients into their disease burden, lower high volume, again, you start seeing a trend towards some improved outcomes in patients with low volume disease. And so when they did this subset analysis, which is always fraught with its own um, statistical problems, they did see a benefit to adding radiation to the primary in low volume, newly diagnosed metastatic patients who were also treated with systemic therapy. These are five trials that are going on uh, in the, you know, the world. Uh, we're participating in that SWOG 1802 study. Some of them look at surgery, some of them look at radiation, and so the jury's not out or these trials wouldn't be going on. If you have a patient with uh, metastatic disease, um, if you refer them, we will consider them for this trial. It randomizes patients, so half of them get treatment and half of them don't to the primary, all of them get the systemic therapy. And then um, within the treatment group, some get surgery and some get radiation, the patient and you decide that. So it's not like a coin flips on what the local treatment would be, but they're kind of stacking it for the right amount for each patient. So the take home messages here, there's uh, kind of new things developing. It used to just be in the CRP space, but now we're getting some uh, treatments that are being moved back into uh, metastatic, newly diagnosed treatments that we knew kind of worked out on the, on the castration resistant. Now they're showing benefit in patients with newly diagnosed metastatic disease. Of course, chemotherapy, particularly for high volume. We have more potent androgen targeting. Now we have three approved agents um, in that space based on new studies. And treatment of the primary is an evolving concept um, and best probably done in, in clinical trials if we can, so we can sit here a couple years from now and be able to tell you likely who might or might not benefit, and if they do benefit, what that treatment should be. So I think that's kind of the changing landscape uh, design uh, for newly diagnosed metastatic, kind of dovetails with the M0 stuff that you heard from Dr. Morgans, and hopefully that'll be helpful to you um, when you see patients with this problem in your practice.